Hello, this is your host, Todd Lewis, of the Praise of Father podcast. Tonight I'm joined by Keith Preston, and we're going to debate the justification of the state and anarchism. So, as an anarchist, Keith, why don't you open up by giving your account of what, what you think is illicit or illegitimate or unjustifiable about the state? Well, in order to really attack something, I think it's first necessary to explain what it is you're attacking. So when anarchists like me say we're against the state, we need to first define what the state is. Uh, there's not a universal consensus on that among anarchists, but this is how I would define the state. I would say that the, to really have an institution that can legitimately be called the state, you'd have to have maybe about a half a dozen or so characteristics. Um, first of all, it would have to be an institution that claims a monopoly on violence in a particular geographical territory. That's the standard Max, Max Weber definition of the state. You would also have to have a, an institution that claims a monopoly on resources in a particular territory and that does so for the purpose of protecting an artificially privileged elite. This is Franz Oppenheimer's argument against the state, that the state is based on conquest for the purpose of monopolizing resources and in the, and in the process of uh, privileging an artificial elite that would not have their position without the uh, support they get from the state. Uh, in addition to have a state, you would have to have an institution that exploits its subjects uh, because that's necessary to have this artificially privileged elite. That's uh, similar to the Marxist argument, although the Marxists believe that the state is merely an outgrowth of capitalism, uh, and whereas I would tend to say that it's more the opposite, that capitalism is the outgrowth of the state, that capitalism is simply the economic arm of the state. Um, also, to have a state, it would have to be an organization that seeks to expand its own power, uh, both externally through imperialism uh, or internally as well through bureaucratic thrust and, and things like that, where the state's always trying to reach into uh, an ever greater number of corners of society. Uh, and another point of view, another characteristic that I think is essential to having a state is all states have some sort of uh, self-legitimating ideological superstructure, and that's uh, some kind of philosophy, religion, ideology that is used to justify the state's existence or the existence of a particular state. Now, that could be any number of things. It could be American exceptionalism. It can be the general will. It could be the dictatorship of the proletariat. It could be the Fuhrer principle, the divine right of kings, you know, the God-emperor concept. It could be any number of things. Uh, but there has to be some philosophical foundation for the um, state that is used to uh, legitimize its, its position. Now, I think that the, you know, those are the basic characteristics of the state as I would define it. Now, it's also necessary to clarify certain things um, and, and also define uh, what the state is not. Uh, I would argue that not all institutions or organizations with some of the characteristics that I just mentioned could necessarily be considered states. Uh, it's also true, I think, that the state is a continuum, not an absolute category. Uh, one analogy I might make would be to something like cancer. Uh, you know, we, we know that people get the disease cancer and die of cancer. Uh, sometimes it may not be necessarily uh, possible to pinpoint exactly when that first cancer cell appeared and the exact millisecond that it appeared or when it appeared. But we do know that cancer cells do develop, they mutate, they um, metastasize and then they eventually kill the, kill the body, right? And I think the state develops the same way. Uh, you know, there may not be some exact moment where we can say, okay, now we have a state, you know, five minutes ago, we didn't have a state. Uh, but I, I would argue that a, a, an institution or an organization becomes a state to the degree that it starts to exhibit the characteristics I described earlier. Uh, also, the state includes the range of elite interests that are connected to this wider system of exploitation. You know, I would argue, for example, that in a country like the United States, uh, the, the state is not just Congress or the president or the Supreme Court, the official branches of government. The state is the entire ruling class apparatus that's connected to that. The big corporations, the central banks, the military industrial complex, the mass media, the elite universities, the elite foundations, all of those kinds of things are part of this wider state system. Uh, and also, it's, it's necessary to describe what the state is not. And I think this is where some anarchists, as well as other people, get, get it wrong. Uh, the state is not any form of violence. Right? Something can be violent, you know, groups and organizations as well as individuals without actually being a state. Um, the guy that sticks a gun in your face in an alley and demands your wallet, uh, he's violent, but he's not a state. Um, 
a street gang that's getting into drive-by shootings over territories it is, you know, they're certainly violent. They're not a state. Um, the state is not any form of hierarchy or authority. Um, the, you know, a monastery, Buddhist or Christian or whatever, certainly has authority and hierarchy. It's not a state. Uh, the, uh, the state is not just any form of coercion. You know, let's say uh, a little kid runs out in the street and starts saying he wants to play in the street. His parents tell him to come back uh, out of the street for his own protection. He says he's not going to, so the parents go and pick him up and carry him off. All right, that's coercion, but that's not a state. You know, the parents don't become a state when that happens. Uh, the state is not any form of exploitation that's possible. You know, you can you know, tell your girlfriend that you're in love with her uh, because you want to get her into the bed, but that, that may be exploitation, but that's not uh, a state per se. Um, uh, the state is not any form of organization. You know, the Cub Scouts are not a state. The you know, stamp collector clubs are not a state. Uh, bird watcher clubs are not a state. Um, the state is not a civil war. Uh, the state is an institution that has to have a monopoly on power and resources. Uh, and this is another issue, and this is important as well. The, the state is not the root of all evil or everything that's bad. There are some anarchists and libertarians that seem to believe that. They, they're almost like the Marxists in the sense that the Marxists seem to believe that if you know only capitalism went away, then nobody would be greedy and everybody would be cooperative and all of our goodness and altruism would shine through. And the, a lot of anarchists and libertarians, both, I mean, different kinds of anarchists, will seem to believe this about the state. Just get rid of this state apparatus and everybody's going to cooperate and be peacefully and follow the be peaceful and follow the non-aggression principle and all of that. I don't think that's the case at all. I mean, you know, with or without the state, there's all kinds of things that are bad about people, about life, about the natural world. Uh, you know, without the, with or without the state, we're still going to have hurricanes and earthquakes and you know, predatory wild animals and predatory human beings and, you know, uh, people that lie, cheat and steal to get what they want and, and things like that. So that I'm not arguing that any, that, you know, abolishing the state is going to re result in the moral regeneration of mankind or human society or anything. Uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm simply arguing that the state is an institution that exhibits the characteristics that I described earlier. Yeah, OK, that's actually a really detailed and interesting definition of the state. Um, the way I would define the state is I agree with you that Weber is somewhat sparse. I mean, it's not necessarily wrong, but it covers too many things. The definition of the state that I'll use is, is from Aristotle. And in, in his book, The Politics, he argues that the ideal society in society, we should seek to have self-reliance. And the atomic unit of society is not the individual and as the libertarians believe, nor the collective as like the Marxists and the fascists believe, but, but it's the family. And so that basic cellular unit of society is itself a, if you will, proto-state. And what happens then is there's two things. There's the, what the family has to do. It has to do at least two things. It has to, A, provide for its own sustenance and self-sufficiency. And it also has to create conditions in which offspring can be raised and then educated to perpetuate the culture that the family is a part of. Now, individual families, much like indiv individuals themselves, can only do so much of that by themselves. And so for the same reason individuals come together to form families, because it's easier to do it if you have other people to work with, not just your spouse, but of course their relations as well. Uh, families come together to form larger assemblies and these larger assemblies, in the context of Aristotle, were more of city-states of the ancient Greek kind. But he allowed for that extension, you know, the cities then come together to create a federation or get conquered and become an empire. But fundamentally, he viewed that man was a political animal. He said that man, no man is an island. No man can live by himself. If he lived by himself, he's either a god or an animal. And since man is neither a god nor purely an animal, he must live in community with others. And this desire for community, this desire and need for community and mutual uh, reinforcing aid is developed at different levels of society. So depending on where you look at that level, you have the individual level, the familial level, maybe the county district level, then the city level, then the state level, then the national level. And if you have a world government, which 
I guess, you know, with Alexander and the Romans, they sort of tried uh, at a global level. And he would argue that at every stage of that process of social interaction, it's the same principle being applied, but just upscaled. And so the state, as he defines it, is a collection of families that come together, um, much as individuals come together to form families, to do two things, to maintain self-sufficiency and to create a system of education and culture in which that they can then A, raise offspring, and then B, incur, uh, create their own culture, perpetuate through education to that offspring. If it fails in any of those three points, it, it, it's a failed state. And so I would argue that the state as an institution, whether uh, whatever your beliefs about it are, with Aristotle, I would argue, are a natural evolution out of the human desire for social interaction and order in the world. So uh, that's how I would define the state. Now, one of the, uh, as far as your definitions of what is and what is not a state, you mentioned the elite interests. Uh, would that be similar to the power elite that was described by John Mills, right? Charles Mills, right? Um, well, there's a wide range of um, elite theorists that ad, that postulate the idea of a power elite. Um, you're thinking about you thinking about C. Wright Mills. Yeah, C. Wright Mills. Yeah. Yeah. Well, C. Wright Mills' theory of what the power elite is it holds up as well as any. Now, there are alternative versions of elite theory besides his from both the left and the right, but as a general rule, I'd say the elite or the ruling class apparatus within any particular state that is the uh, you know, whose interest the organization of society is geared towards, um, you know, what, what's commonly called the leisure class or, or what the Marxists call the ruling class. You know, there's a, there's a, I, I don't really entirely agree with the Marxist definition of what the ruling class is, but because uh, I think the ruling class is more than just those who control means of production. But uh, I would argue that the, uh, the elite or those interests connected to the state for whom, and whose interests society is organized towards. That's the, you know, regardless of what its uh, impact on others would be. Okay. Okay. So I think that the, so if I'm, if I'm correct, the definition you gave is if it, to be a state, to be considered a state, this institution has to meet all five of the criteria you listed, monopoly on violence, monopoly on resources for a privileged minority, institutions that exploit their subjects, seek to expand its power via imperialism or through totalitarian, you know, internal policing, and then a, a, a self-legitimating ideology. So if it has, even lacks one of those, it would not, in your mind, properly be called a state, correct? Uh, for the most part, I would agree with that, yeah, with some, with some qualifications. Uh, you know, I suppose you could have a state that you know, whose legitimating ideology was not very uh, well inculcated. Um, you know, you, you can certainly have a state that, you know, the people that, that over which it rules still hate, hate, hate their rulers, you know, and don't view them as legitimate. And then the state just real rules by sheer force and violence. You know, that happens in instances where societies become very polarized or where uh, a dictatorship or, uh, or an empire is formed and, and just rules by conquest. That can happen. Um, that's generally not the norm, though, with states. Uh, but I would say that to really have a state, you would have to have this kind of system of exploitation of some particular type. Uh, you know, the state is not just any kind of coercion or any kind of organization or any kind of system of rules. Um, I think that's where a lot of anarchists and libertarians actually miss the boat, is I, I hear states being defined as all kinds of things coming from uh, some of those circles, and of course, among critics of anarchism as well. But I think the state is something more specific than what is often labeled as the state. Okay, yeah, the reason why I brought that up is because um, the mafia would meet one through four, but not five. It has a monopoly on violence. It, it monopolizes resources in a locality for the mob boss and his family. It has institutions of exploitation, and it seeks to expand its power vis-a-vis -vis other criminal cartels both internally through intimidation, where you intimidate people within your own cartel, but you also use, you know, gang wars and attack. Like, you know, a classic example would be like the different gangs during the Great Depression, where you had like, you know, the Purple Gang, the Jewish Gang, and then you had, you know, the Italians with, um, I can't think of his name now, but uh, the guy that was busted on tax evasion. Al Capone. Al Capone, yeah. And so they don't really have, a, they didn't really have an, 
legitimating ideology, but they do well, meet oh, one, right. one to four. I mean, sorry. All right, go ahead. No problem. Um, well, I would argue that they don't necessarily have number one. They don't have a monopoly on violence. The, the government that, you know, an organized crime group doesn't have a monopoly on violence. The government under which they live and function still has the monopoly on violence. Now, they're a group that's challenging that monopoly, but they still have, the government still has a monopoly on violence, as Al Capone and a lot of those other guys found out, um, as, ah. as John Gotti found out. Uh, so they don't, they don't have a monopoly on violence. Uh, now, they do try to control territory, but they, they don't exclusively control territory uh, because they still are functioning within a state system. They, uh, they certainly exist to privilege and exploitive elite. That, that goes without saying. Um, and they do it by exploiting other people, victims of crimes and you know, extortion rackets and things like that. Uh, they, they don't have a legitimating ideology um, external to themselves. They have an internally... Uh, legitimating ideology and the mafia and groups like that have all kinds of initiation ritual ceremonies as do gangs and other similar groups um, so that's why I would say the mafia is not a state the mafia has a, some of the characteristics of the state but it also functions within a wider state system and lacks certain state characteristics as, a, as well okay I, I think a, I think one point that might need to be clarified is what do we mean by monopoly on force so for an example with, within their own territory, uh, if you're beneath Al Capone, he has a monopoly on force vis-a-vis you. But of course, vis-a-vis -vis the state and the federal government, um, he doesn't because the, the feds could come in any moment. Now, in a hypothetical world, we have a one world government and it's a global, like Star, like Star Trek. And there's, you know, federate, there's probably federate nations and then federate states beneath that, beneath that, beneath that. So does the monopoly mean the guy at the highest geopolitical position has, you know, having the final say? Is that what you mean by a monopoly? Uh, what I mean is that the monopoly is possessed by he who was able to essentially back up his will by force and have the last word, which, you know, in the case of something like the mafia is going to be the government. Um, you know, the, the, the mafia can certainly, individual members of the mafia can commit crimes. They can conspire with other members of the mafia to commit crimes. Uh, but they're still doing this clandestinely. They're still doing this uh, on an underground basis. They can still be arrested and prosecuted and indicted and, and put in prison and things like that. You know, so they're they're no different than ordinary criminals in that sense. They're I mean, they're just okay. a sophisticated organization. You know, they don't so, have well, a monopoly on violence. So if, okay, so what you're saying is the monopoly on violence is when you use violence, you have the last word on it. But let me give you an it example. Has to be credible. You have to credible. Have yeah, a credible monopoly. Violence. Well, let, let's let's say that um, you have a federal government. Let, you know, let's say let's say the United States in fifty years, uh, the 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 process of centralization is reversed. Or let's go to let's do Mexico right now, Mexico. Let's say the federal government has credible military assets, but in the future it becomes so decentralized because states and cartels grow it at a pace that the government can't control, and there's a kind of equilibrium and a standoff. Um, the government could, if it wanted to, go in there and just trash the place, but they could also hit back really hard, too, with their own assets. Which one of those contenders would be the government? Well, the, who, who have the monopoly on force in that case is what I mean. Well, in the case of uh, a situation like what you have in Mexico, where you have whole sections of the country that have been taken over by these um, criminal organizations, these uh, cartels, I'd argue that that's essentially this kind of situation you have in a failed state, and it's not the only example we see of that worldwide. Uh, you, you have a system where you don't really have an organization that has a monopoly on uh, the use of violence and has a self-legitimating ideology and these other characteristics. Instead, what you have is a situation where it's it's not really anarchism either, because it's not you know. Um, Anything that would be recognized as anarchy, anarchism in the in the ideological sense, it might be anarchy in the in the pejorative sense, but you have a failed state situation, which is essentially just a type of civil war. Uh, I've spent time in Mexico, and uh, what what actually happens in Mexico is that um, you will have um, different sections of the country and different sections of cities where the government has control. The Mexican government, you'll have other sections uh, where the cartels, you know, one or more cartel will have control. Uh, the police in a lot of Mexican cities are, are so corrupt, they essentially work as, a, as an extortion racket, kind of like the, the mafia, the, the stereotype of what the mafia is. 
In fact, it's so bad in some places that the uh, fed, the government, the Mexican government, will actually send in the army, what they call the federales, which are really just the Mexican army. They'll send those in to police the police. I mean, I've actually seen this in Mexican cities. You actually you'll see a guy uh, standing on a street corner in a in a military uniform with a machine gun or an AK-47, and his job is to a keep the cartels from coming into certain sections of cities that are more upper class or middle class areas or tourist areas where they hope to make a lot of money. Uh, and they're also there to police the police to keep the police from preying on tourists and and uh, you know and, and, and on ordinary citizens. Uh, so Mexico is a is a society that you know, is at least in in, area, in certain areas, certain geographical areas, is approaching being an actual failed state. But I, I don't consider that to be either the state or anarchism. It's it's more like a civil war. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So the the other thing is this work gets kind of interesting uh, on on um because see the more specific you define the state, the, the of course that restricts the category of institutions you can call the state, and we see this as a problem with the late Murray Bookchin. Uh, Murray Bookchin later on in life not only sort of abandoned his cynicalism in favor of uh, egoism like Sterner, but he also was known for his praise of the Athenian uh, democracy and of the New England uh, Puritans and their sort of town hall meetings. So, you know, Massachusetts Bay Colony, Athens. Now, some anarchists say, Bookchin, you're not an anarchist anymore because those aren't anarchist societies. But I would would the Massachusetts Bay Co Co Company or would uh, a ancient Athens really meet all the criteria that you gave? And how does we how do you negotiate that? Because that was a problem with Bookchin. Yeah, well, Bookchin is is interesting. Um, Bookchin was a lifelong in art. Well, I, no, he was, he had actually started off as a Marxist. I think he was a Trotskyist, um, or maybe he was in the Communist Party initially. I don't know. But you know, by the by the nineteen sixties at least, when he started writing and becoming well known, he had become an anarchist. And he identified strongly with the anarcho-communist syndicalist tradition. Uh, he was somewhat uh, non-sectarian, though, about some of that. Like he would actually speak at conventions of the Libertarian Party and groups like that, as opposed to denouncing them as fascists, like some of the contemporary uh, ANCOMs would. Uh, but I actually met Murray Bookchin once years ago, probably about 27 years ago or something like that. But um, yeah, over time, I think what happened with Murray Bookchin was that he simply became uh, very disdainful of the way the left-wing anarchist movement had become uh, oriented towards lifestyle politics and things like that. And he was more in the old left, you know, revolutionary uh, vein. And I think he decided, though, that the working class had lost its revolutionary potential in modern societies, you know, similar, ironically, to the Frankfurt School critique. And he started developing this philosophy that he called communalism, which I view as just anarcho-communism under another name, although he had this orientation towards you know, independent municipalities that are self-managed and things like that. Um, but there, there are several issues that, that are, come out of that. Um, first, as far as the um, definition of the state that you were giving er, earlier, uh, citing Aristotle, it might be a bit presumptuous to, to disagree with Aristotle, but I'm going to have to disagree with Aristotle. I don't, <laughs> I, I don't see, I don't agree that the state and the family are analogous to one another. I think that's like comparing apples and oranges. Um, there was a, um, an essay that Herbert Spencer wrote back in the 19th century where he addressed this issue of the relationship between the state and the family, and he was arguing that state ethics and family ethics are, are different categories of um, of endeavor or different categories of um, human behavior. Now, I don't necessarily agree with the direction he was trying to take this in, but I think the critique itself stands. Um, what I would argue is that there's a natural bond between families and people who are blood relatives or people who are uh, member, close members of the same community or friends. Uh, there's a natural bond there that doesn't exist between the state and its subjects. You know, I would argue the, the relationship between the state and subjects is not like a family relationship. It's more like the, the relationship between a robber and a victim or the relationship maybe uh, between a CEO and an employee or something like that. I, I think that you know, the, the family equals the state ideas is comparing apples and oranges. I think that's a bit of a reach. Uh, now, I, w I would qualify that by saying that it's certainly possible to have social organization where you have families, you have extended families, you have communities, 
you know, in more traditional societies, you have tribes and clans and all of that. You find that in traditional societies all over the world among indigenous people and, 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 and so forth. Uh, that form of social organization is not necessarily a state. You know, a collection of, of, of tribes and clans is not necessarily a state per se. Uh, it becomes a state. I mean, you can even have a, a representative, you know, um, tribal clan system where you have you know, councils of elders and things that, that make decisions for the group. Um, but that's not a state. It only becomes a state when this system of artificial or non-organic non privilege is imposed. Um, and, and as far as like the Greek cities and all that, um, I, I've discussed this with you before on some of the other podcasts we've done, but the way I see statism is once again, it, I see statism as a continuum. It's not just one point where we say, statism over here, non-statism over here. I'd say that the state is more like a zero to 100 scale. If we say pure anarchism is 100 and something like Kim Jong-un or Pol Pot or something like that is zero, then most institutions that we call states are certainly in between those, anywhere from maybe you know Switzerland or Liechtenstein, which is in the 70, 80 percent range, or and you know something like um, you know some of the more authoritarian states that are in the 30, 40 percent range. You know most of our modern liberal democracies are probably in the 50, 60 percent range. Um, so that's the uh, you know that's the scale on which I would evaluate this whole continuum of state of statism. And it's how that re would relate to something like the Greek cities or the New England town meetings. You know, I would say that those are, those are maybe small states or minor states or maybe prototypical states that certainly could have the potential to evolve into states. Um, the Greek cities internally certainly had characteristics that I would consider to be status. Uh, number one, they had slaves in those systems. Number one, uh, the status of women in those Greek cities was actually very low. Uh, you know, a lot of modern people talk about how enlightened and, and progressive the ancient Greeks were. No, that the women had the same status as they do in Saudi Arabia and Afghanistan and places like that. Um, and, uh, and they had slavery. They executed Socrates for heresy or whatever. So these were authoritarian, exploitive state systems. Now, they weren't on the massive scale as some of the other ancient empires. Uh, and for that reason, I think they did achieve, reach, reach a higher level of cultural and political achievement um, than many of the other ancient uh, civilizations did. You know, the Greek cities were, you know, they were states, they were they were prototypical states perhaps, they, but they weren't the Persian empire, they weren't Babylon, they weren't Egypt, they weren't uh, any of these other uh, ancient tyrannies. So- Okay, okay. so real quick. Um so basically, to use a, to use a biblical example, the patriarchs and the judges are maybe like ten to twenty. Uh, Saul might be like a fifty. David is getting to maybe to a seventy, and you know by the time you get to Solomon, you're like ninety ninety five. Because well, by that know, point, yeah, yeah, that's a good that works. But you've got the numbers in reverse. Like, oh, sorry, sorry. <laughs> the, the the yeah, the dictator, absolute monarch, is the zero. So Solomon is the zero, and then yes. that the the passage from the book of Samuel. I forgot if it's. It's, it's first Samuel eight. Yeah, that'd be like a, maybe a, a ninety five. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That's exactly right. Um, or, or if we look at uh, New England, the town meetings. Um, you know, and, and and not just the New England town meetings, but the, some of the utopian religious colonies that existed in early America, the Quaker colonies and the Hutterites and Shakers and and uh, all the others. Um, you know, those were you know quasi anarchistic systems that were sort of prototypical states and then they kind of grew into states over time and you know to the degree that you know they exercised uh you know system uh, artificial privilege over their members or over others over their subjects they became states you know certainly the uh the something like the, the salem witch trials you know i'd argue that's a certainly a type of statism there i mean it's uh you know it's a religious persecution or the treatment of the quaker people that you would see in some of the new england communities as well um so but but they're still you know they weren't um, they weren't the spanish empire you know of the time i mean they weren't that uh, or any of the european empires but they were you know many states prototypical states um and again th to look at this um the scale that I'm talking about, the sliding scale, we can find all kinds of examples of that. Uh, one example is the U.S. Constitution, right? On one hand, the U.S. Constitution is an in interesting mixture of a lot of libertarian ideas like the separation of powers, divided sovereignty, representative democracy, the Bill of Rights, and all of these things. 
but it still exists within this kind of meta system of a capitalist class dictatorship. I think that's one thing the Marxists get right in their interpretation of American history, and that you know the the U.S. constitutional system was actually set up to be a type of capitalist class or proto-capitalist class dictatorship. And you see that if you look at all the different uh, writings of the authors of the Constitution and the specific things they disliked about the Articles of Confederation. You know, they didn't like the fact that the states had laws that were too friendly to debtors. You know, they didn't like the fact that there wasn't a more organized, uh, efficient system of returning fugitive slaves. They didn't like the fact that they weren't able to easily raise an army to suppress farmer rebellions like Shays' Rebellion and Bacon's Rebellion or you know, the Whiskey Rebellion, you know, they didn't like the fact that they weren't able to expand westward as rapidly and as uh, efficiently as they wanted to. So, you know, you, you, you see this kind of, you know, kind of quasi-libertarian system being merged with this kind of class dictatorship that's uh, in, in early American history. Um, so again, it's a scale. It's not just absolute categories. And I think, I think both a lot of anarchists and anti-anarchists make that mistake. Um, you know, it's, it, it, there's a whole lot of gray area in some of these kinds of things. Sure. sure. One, one, one thing that I wish I had pointed out earlier was um, to flesh out Aristotle a little bit more and give you a kind of a complete classical political theory. Aristotle in his Nicomachean Ethics discusses virtue and vice. And virtue and vice are attributes or habits that an individual can acquire by performing acts that are either virtuous or vicious. And the way it usually sets up was courage is a good example. Courage is the golden mean. Um, you have excess or a deficiency. Excess and deficiencies are both vices, but they're not equally bad. So rashness is an excess. Uh, cowardice is a deficiency. They're both vices, but rashness is better than cowardice. Now, then he divides there's three kinds of government. There's rule the one, rule the few, and rule the many. And each form of government has a virtuous and a vicious side. The, the rule of the one who's virtuous is the king, monarchy. The vicious one is the tyranny. The rule of the few that is virtuous is the aristocracy. The rule of the many, or few, which is bad, is an oligarchy. The rule of the many, which is good, is politeia, polity, from where we get the word politics. And then the bad form is democracy. Now, the reason why virtue, the virtuous ruler acts in such an interest for the interest of the well-being of the whole. And this is again where, the, where he gets into the family dynamic, the husband, acts with the authority over the woman, his wife and children, but for their own betterment. Whereas the dictator and the tyrant acts against their best interests. So now then he says that um, the next level would be the Republic, which comes from Cicero. And he argues that the Republic is a compilation of all three uh, forms of government. So in the US context, uh, which I think was partly inspired by Cicero and Aristotle, is that the president is supposed to be the monarchical executive element. The um, Congress and Senate are, you know, more supposed to be the Senate, the Republic, the aristocratic element. Then there's the, the popular wing of the government, which I forget right now what it is, where it's more of a popular voice. For, for England, rather, it's like the House of Commons is the democratic element and the House of Lords is the aristocratic element and the queen or the prime minister is the executive element. But regardless, that's how the classical political theory fleshes out. And I more or less accept the contours with some minor dinkering here and there. But you made an interesting point about families and the state being disanalogous. So you said that you know families are usually based off of uh, blood relations. Now, I suppose right, we have two thought experiments here we could use. We could use one and say, well, let's say a tribe, um, I'll, I'll use the Hebrews, grow to such a number that they're all still related by blood from one ancestral person, Jacob. But by now there's hundreds of thousands of them. Um, but they're still related in blood, however distant, and they still see themselves as the same people and other people are different than them. You know, if they, when they get to a certain size, they'll need institutions that are a lot larger than your average tribal council. Um, and the other thing is a family can, can have the same sort of um, intimate relation with a person not of their blood. So for example, in the Roman Empire, uh, there was a practice called adoption. Now adoption for them is a little bit different than for us. Uh, you could adopt somebody and he could be a full heir to you and you couldn't disinherit him once you made that decision. But your own flesh and blood son could be disinherited. So you have this, he's a family member, one of the family, but he could be from a, a, a freed slave, could be anybody. 
And so we have the, the disanalogy, I think, doesn't quite work because we could have families that are closely, intimately bonded together, even if they're not of the same blood. And the same blood can still grow to such a tribal size that it becomes a de facto state because of its size. Well, the, I'm, I'm familiar with the different typologies of different types of states that Plato and Aristotle and others wrote about. Um, I, I would have several issues with that. Um, first, is to, when I was talking about uh, family ethics versus state ethics, and I was talking about how the family is an institution of natural bonding, I didn't necessarily just mean blood relatives. Um, it's certainly, you know, blood relatives are a big part of that, but there's also uh, adopted family members, family members by marriage, uh, members of your no local community, your next door neighbor who were de facto family. Uh, and you can also have extended you know, quasi families of people that are not directly related to each other. Um, it, well, like for example, uh, instead of using the uh, family, the, you know, the biological family as an analogy, we could talk about a large group of people that have some other common affinity. You know, let's say uh, Star Wars fans or comic book fans or something like that. Okay, well, you could have this organization or federation or a set of tribes of Star Wars fans, and you know, they're oriented towards uh, going to Star Star Wars fan conventions and and you know, dressing up like their favorite Star Wars characters and all that. And they could even do this in a very formalistic way. You could have the you know the council of elders of the of the of, of the Star Wars fan club with their yeah, you know, they could make policies for the club and things like that. But I would disagree that something like that would constitute a state. Uh, it, it was it's not necessarily there to maintain some kind of system of exploitation. I mean, there may still be conflict internally. You know, some somebody wants to declare February Luke Skywalker month. Somebody else wants February to be Darth Vader month or something like that. There could be conflict, but it's not necessarily a system of privileging some. Uh, through the exploitation of others. Uh, so I, I argue that you know that's the, the problem I see with the family analogy. Now, as far as the typologies that, that Plato and Aristotle and others were using, I, I'd have to say that, you know, in what context did they develop this set of, set of theories? And what I see them doing is developing a set of political theory that is essentially being used to legitimize the pre-existing systems that they were a part of. Um, they may have looked at, you know, the Greek monarchies as opposed to the um, uh, tyrannies or the, you know, the oligarchies versus the democracies uh, and said, well, this one functions better than that one. You know, this king or ruler or whatever is more benevolent than, than this other one, uh, this democratic city state elects better leaders or votes for better policies than this other one. But underlying all that is still this pre-existing system of exploitation. You know, like I said, they had slaves in that system. Uh, the you know, women were treated as chattel in that system. They persecuted heretics and that and political dissidents in those systems. All of that stuff predates these kinds of uh, city states that they had. Now even now these city states in Greece may not have been, you know, again, they may not have been the, the Romans, they may not have been the Persians, they may not have been the Egyptians or the Babylonians, but they were still a, a system of uh, an exploited state system or at least proto-states. Um, so I think that the uh, the problem with some of the typologies that come out of classical philosophy is what what is its foundation? I mean, uh, what, what, what premise are they arguing from? Uh, we, we could transfer that to modern politics and we could look at governments around the world and we could say, well, okay, the, the Western liberal parliamentary democracies generally, uh, not always, but generally afford their people a greater set of uh, you know, individual civil rights or political rights or, or maintain a higher standard of living for their people or something like that than say North Korea or you know, some of the countries that are ruled by African dictators or, or, uh, or the, you know, the remnants of the Hindu caste system in India. But it's still uh, a, a case that all of these systems have this uh, pre-existing system of exploitation that underlies it. We could even look that look at that within a domestic political system, within a singular system, within a singular state. We can look at you know American history, and we could say, okay, we've had 45 presidents. You know, some of them were better than others. Some of them did awful things. Some of them did good things. And it, you know, it may be that these individual presidents, you know, uh, in terms of their personal character may have been virtuous individuals or at least 
strive to be virtuous individuals. Um, you know, I, I don't know that, uh, you know, at least some of the U.S. presidents have necessarily been people that wanted the, the, you know, the common people to be miserable or, 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 or unhappy or oppressed or anything like that. Um, but it's still with it, their their system of rules still took place within this wider system of art or uh, non-organic artificial privilege and rulership. Uh, you know, take a guy like Jimmy Carter, for example, by all accounts. Jimmy Carter is a decent guy. He, you know, he seems to be in his personal life, you know, in, in his non-political professional life. He, I, in my, contrary to what many people believe, I don't think he was the worst president we ever had. I actually think he was one of the better ones. But, uh, but he was still part of this same system, the same kind of uh, system of, you know, this this kind of state capitalist class dictatorship, this kind of system of state exploitation. Uh, and he became a part of that system, and and that's what all of the individual presidents do. In fact, that's one thing that you know the anarchists will always say. Well, look, you voted for this guy, and look what he became. He became part of the system. So I think the problem is the the underlying system. You know, whether the individual ruler aspires to be uh, a decent person on a personal level or not is you know certainly a, a relevant issue, but not really the, the, the crux of the issue. Um, in fact, I saw something related to that interest that was interesting recently. I was, I was reading about uh, Kim Jong-un um, of North Korea, and uh, I was reading about a fellow who had known him during his teenage years, and this fellow was another North Korean. He worked for the family, the, the ruling family. I forgot what his capacity was. Maybe he was like the, the chef or something, you know, some, some, some position like that. Uh, but he talks about how, uh, you know, he would go out and shoot basketball hoops with Kim Jong-un when Kim Jong-un is like 18 years old or 16 or something like that. And he's, he mentioned once that Kim Jong-un uh, said, well, you know, yeah, you know, you and I, you know, being part of the, the state, the elite, we, we, we have it good. But what about the people? They don't really have it that good. Uh, yeah, you know, he seemed genuinely troubled by this or, or, or concerned about this. Uh, another story this guy tells about Kim Jong-un is that uh, apparently uh, at one point there was a, a collapse of an apartment building in North Korea and uh, a lot of the people living there died. It was like a terrible you know, uh, thing where uh, you know, people were killed and things like that. And he said that Kim Jong-un seemed genuinely troubled by this. He seemed genuinely upset that this had happened and that people had died. And that's not the image we have of him in the West, obviously. You know, we, we have this image of him as this tyrant that's a maniac. The, you know, he, he orders people executed for trivial reasons and to consolidate his own power. He's more like, you know, he's more like John Gotti or something like that. And, you know, you know probably he has both sides to that, both of those sides to his personality or character or something like that. So the point being that it is, you know, this, a system that is based on um, exploitation and privileged by non-organic or artificial means and backed up by coercive force and so forth is going to produce these kinds of negative results. It doesn't really matter whether the individual ruler, you know, the king, the president, the prime minister, or the, the congressman or whatever thinks this is a good thing or not, or whether he or she aspires to be a personally virtuous person or not. Maybe they are, you know, maybe they do, maybe they don't. It probably, that all depends on the individual. So it's, it's the system that's the problem, in other words. Okay. Yeah, okay. I have three questions that I think are all kind of related to this. So the, the first question is, you, you made a distinction that, well, you know, ancient Athens had state-like properties because it had slavery. Uh, w women were, were seen as being disadvantaged, at least from our perspective, saying as disadvantaged by their society. Now, the traditional family system, going back as far back as we have recorded history, up until the 1920s, uh, um, what, no, within different societies, women had more or less liberties than they do, but they were fundamentally subjected to their husbands in a legal fashion. Now, well, just, real quick, let me just qualify that by saying that in ancient Greece, in many of those cities, women were not allowed to be seen in public unless they were prostitutes. I mean, they had the same status as, say, women under the Taliban or something like that. That's a whole different matter than... Okay. In, Western tradition, you know, the where, you know, we didn't have women's suffrage until 1919 or something like that. Yeah, that's that's a much different uh, system. Oh, okay, but, but what I'm getting at is, you see the disanal Do you see the disanalogy arising because of the, the unequal power relationships between, say, the husband and his wife and the parents and their children, as opposed to the civil authorities versus their subjects? 
yeah, I think that is a disanalogous uh, relationship. Yeah, I, I think that there can be power imbalances in an institution or organization or set of relationships without that being a state per se. In fact, uh, one disagreement that I have with a lot of the left-wing anarchists or anarcho-communists and people like that is that they will say that any kind of organization is a form of authoritarianism in some instances. Uh, others say that if there's not perfect equality down to the, you know, the nth degree uh, in some kind of organization or institution, that that by itself is a state. Uh, they will say that to, to be an anarchist, you also have to be against you know, hierarchy or authority of any kind. I think that's a separate question. I, I think you can be for or against the state and have whatever views about authority or hierarchy in other contexts. But I think it's possible, for example, for a family to be internally patriarchal or whatever in a traditionalist sense you know, where dad is the head of the household, or, or if it's an extended family, you know, great grandpa, you know, great great grandpa is the head of the household, and where women, children, you know, even adult sons have a somewhat subordinate position. Uh, I think that that's more analogous to something like a business, you know, or, um, of course, a lot of anarchists don't, don't believe in a hierarchical business. Ah, business okay. Either. But, but, but the state is unique in the sense that it has the properties that I did described at the beginning of our discussion. The state has this system of not only hierarchy, not only exploitation, not only coercion, you know, but a monopoly on these things for the purpose of monopolizing resources and for the purpose of privileging uh, a non-organic, uh, artificially privileged elite through exploitation, backed up by coercion and with a self-legitimating ideology. Okay, uh, the second question, I'm going to open up with a quotation from St. Augustine, uh, The City of God, Book 4, Chapter 4, about the, about the pirate in Alexander. Justice being taken away, then what are kings but great robberies? For what are robberies themselves but little kingdoms? The band itself is made up of men. It is ruled by the authority of a prince. It is knit together by the pact of a confederacy. The booty is divided by the law agreed on. If by the admittance of abandoned men, this evil increases to such a degree that it holds fake places fixed abodes, takes possession of cities and seduced peoples, it assumes the more plainly the name of a kingdom, because the reality is now manifestly conferred on it, not by the removal of covetousness, but by the addition of impunity. Indeed, that was an apt and true reply which was given to Alexander the Great by the pirate who had seized him. For when that king has been asked the man what he meant by keeping hostile possession of the sea, he answered with bold pride, what do you mean by seizing the whole earth? But because I do it with a petty ship, I am called a robber while you who do it with a great fleet are styled an emperor. So the point that I want to ask about this is, you seem to think that the institution of the state of necessity uh, is corrupting to virtue. Now, is it possible that there could be a system that meets all the state, well, most of those criteria that you gave for the state, but the institution itself is bent towards virtue. So it's not so much you have a, you have a lot or you get a, where you get a virtuous individual that just happens to pop in, the classical and medieval concept of justice and a virtuous state was that the institutions of the state itself were conditioned towards, virt well, again, it's teleological. Teleology is the study of purpose and direction. If the state was directed towards, its institutions were directed towards what's the good, then it's virtuous. If its institutions were directed against what's bad, it's vicious. So is it impossible on your account for a state to ever be virtuous in that sense? Because you seem to think that they're all vicious in the sense that the apparatus is always bent towards hurting people. Um, I, well, I, again, I think it's a continuum. Um, I don't think it's a matter of absolute categories, but I would say, yeah, ultimately the anarchists are right when they say that the state is like a criminal organization writ large. You know, that the part of the quote from Augustine you just read where he, he said that, where he compares the uh, you know, what is, or the, 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 like the story at the end where they're saying, well, what is the emperor but a pirate writ large? Ultimately, I agree with that. And I think that that's what the state ultimately is. It's a criminal gang writ large that maintain, maintains a monopoly on power and it has this self-legitimating ideological superstructure and all that. Now, it's also true that there could be different levels of this. I mean, you can have a state that is more or less virtuous 
uh, as opposed to one that, uh, you know, just like you can have a, a criminal gang that's more or less virtuous. Like you have some criminal gangs, for example, that uh, they generally have an internal policy that they don't kill unless it's necessary. Or if they kill somebody, you're expected to do it with a one clean shot or thrust of a sword or whatever. You have other criminal gangs that go out of their way to kill people, even when it doesn't even seem to benefit them that much. Um, you have others that you know go out of their way to make their victims suffer, uh, just to set an example or display their power for its own sake. So, and you have states like that as well. Uh, you have states that you know may be less oppressive than others, or or more oppressive than others. Um, getting back to Franz Oppenheimer earlier, he was a, a classical liberal theorist that lived in Germany in the early 20th century. And he argued that modern liberal democratic states had uh, sort of taken the kinds of oppression that you find in um, ancient tyrannies, you know, like the Babylonians and all of that and the Romans and watered it down a bit to where you know modern democracies gave their people a, uh, a higher standard of living uh, a, a better uh, system of political representation or more civil rights and things like that uh, oh now i also think there's a lot of criticisms of modern liberal democracy that don't get voiced uh, that, that are interesting as well but we can argue certainly that some states are better than others i mean we can look at the current government of china under um, President uh, Z and say, well, you know, there's plenty of things wrong with that system, but it's not what it was during the Great Leap Forward. Or, you know, we can look at the uh, government of Russia and look at what Putin is doing and say, well, there are problems with him, but he's not Joseph Stalin. Um, and, you know, we can look at, um, you know, any any system and make those kinds of different uh, variations. I mean, even society, even different states can evolve and change over time. I mean, the uh, the government of Iran today has its issues, but it's not what it was during the Ayatollah's revolution back in 1979 and 80. Um, and Cambodia, the government of Cambodia today, whatever its problem, it's not the Khmer Rouge. So certainly some states can be worse than others. Some states can be more oppressive or more tyrannical than others. Some rulers, heads of state, political authorities can be more well-intentioned than others. Um, but I think ultimately state systems are still based on this system of oppression and exploitation. And, you know, they still are ultimately this criminal gang writ large, um, irrespective of the personal motivations of their individual members. Uh, you know, whether Jimmy Carter really cared about human rights or not is, is, a, is a, an interesting question. But uh, I really think that's kind of beside the point. Yeah, OK. Yeah. Um I think maybe I didn't ask the question maybe as precisely as I needed to, but let me let me refine it with two more questions. When I, when I when the when the medieval and classical uh, thinkers and philosophers say that it's uh, as the quote that I wrote, Augustine said that a state without virtue or, or justice is the word he used is a robber state. Now, what what he mean so what he means by that is if the state is is if its institutions are Forget the individuals. Look at the institutions. Are are the institutions per permanently or more often than not bent against virtue, which means they're vicious? Now, if they're more or less bent towards virtue, then it's more or less virtuous. So, would it be the case that a have there been any virtuous states? Do you do you think in that sense in history? And then b is it is it possible in theory or in practice? No, I understood your original question. Uh, maybe I didn't answer it as clearly as I could have. Uh, no, Augustine was saying that a state can be like an individual. It can be virtuous or non-virtuous and with varying degrees of scales of virtue. Um, and if, I guess he's saying that if the preponderance of virtue is greater than the preponderance of non-virtue, then it's a generally a just state. I, I would ultimately have to say no to that because I'd have to say that, again, as I understand and define the state, the state by its nature is built on exploitation and oppression. Now, you can have a, a state that's less exploitive or less op oppressive or, or rulers that are less um, uh, predatory or, or benevolent. So that scale does exist. You know, and you know, th then that gets into arguments that a lot of traditional conservatives make. Well, shouldn't a state that you know, is generally more benign than others be given the benefit of the doubt. And, and then when you start talking about things like revolutions, I mean, under 
what circumstances should you be willing to embrace the kind of dislocations and uncertainty and upheaval that come with revolutions? You know, isn't it better to tolerate a state that's oppressive, but at least keeps order or at least tolerate a state that at least does some you know, virtuous things and, you know, and just overlook the non-virtuous things. That's a separate set of arguments. You know, I think, I think there's a, those issues involve a lot of different kinds of complexities that are, you know, involve somewhat different questions. But as I define the state, there's no such thing as a virtuous state, ultimately. I mean, the state, you know, as I, as I understand, as I interpret it, is the criminal, you know, a criminal, the mafia with the flag, you know, that's the traditional anarchist view of the state, the mafia with the flag. Um, but a mafia that's, you know, gaining a monopoly on what's perceived to be the legitimate use of power. You know, some mafias may be worse than other mafias, and some mafia leaders may be less virtuous than others, but it, it's not... Uh, it's a matter of scale. It's not. It's not something that I think can really be um, legitimated on its own terms. Yeah. Okay. I, I think. Um, well, there's a, there's a third question I want to ask, but I think to wrap this one up, I think part of the way that we look at the state is is born out of a, a fundamental, deeper disagreement between moral realism and moral anti-realism, which is again beyond the scope of this actual debate. But being a uh, um, a follower of Nietzsche and Max Stirner, I think you would agree with the moral anti-realist that moral truths, moral reality is it doesn't actually exist outside of us. It's something that we might create uh, because it's convenient to prevent us from slitting each other's throats, but it's not actually real. Um, all right, that's, that's my point of view. Not all anarchists or libertarians believe that. There are many libertarians and anarchists that are moral realists of some type. They believe in natural rights, the kinds of ideas that came out of the Enlightenment. There are some religious anarchists that actually believe in divine command uh, ethics. Um, and uh, there are others that believe in natural justice and, and all these kinds of things. Uh, you know, I tend to take more of a subjectivist view of those kinds of questions in the sense that I think, yeah, you know, ethics, morals, values, virtues, those are ideas that we create for ourselves based on our own perceived needs and interests. You know, for example, uh, you know, some of the more basic things like that, you know, we societies uh, have rules against murder you know, for the sake of individual and collective self-protection. You know, it's whether murder is right or wrong in some cosmic sense might just be somebody's opinion but it's uh but ultimately for most people the right to not be murdered is more important than the right to murder other people there are some people who don't feel that way but most people do um and the same is true with any you know at the set of ethical values you know say this uh, I, I would you know, we could use a comparison to animals you know when you have a wild animal that preys on humans or preys on other animals or things like that well, you know, maybe we could say, well, that animal is not a virtuous animal. Well, maybe maybe he is or maybe he isn't, you know, that that bear or mountain lion or tiger or whatever. But the bottom line is you still have to protect yourself against this wild animal or you have to protect your garden against this wild animal, your your livestock against this wild animal. Um, and that really, to me, is the basis of things like virtue and ethics and, and things of that nature. You know, without you know, I don't really buy into a lot of the kind of cosmic um justifications for ideas like that, that that many people have. Although, as I said, that's not true of all anarchists and libertarians. Many, in fact, I'd be inclined to argue even the majority of anarchists or libertarians are um, are moral realists as opposed to moral skeptics or subjectivists like I am. Um, so that's one issue. Um, but again, I guess it gets down to this question of, you know, how do we define justice? Um, you know, in the first place, I yeah, I tend to look at it like justice is again culturally relative, and it's and it's subjective to the human experience. When we say that uh, the state is a system that is built on exploitation, oppression, it's a criminal gang writ large. You know, there may not be anything wrong with that in some cosmic sense. You know, I mean, the asteroids out in space may not care about that, but it's relative to our own experience, you know, both for most people, not being oppressed is more important to them than the right to oppress others. Again, not everybody feels that way. They're, they're outliers. Um, but that's really the, uh, the, the crux of the issue, as I would understand it. This is a very pragmatic, though subjective approach to ethics. Yeah, yeah. I was just saying, pointing out, I think that's a fundamental 
the, to, to solve the problem of our definition of the state, we'd have to dig a little deeper than we can tonight. But the other question that I wanted to ask you was, now, you've actually, I think, written about this some years ago as well, but how has Herman Hoppe kind of made, in Democracy the God that Failed, this kind of, even a lot of anarcho-capitalists were a little sketchy about it, but he said that the monarchy was a private state and was really fundamentally different than, than states as we think of them, because monarchies were just essentially private governments, and they were similar to anarcho-capitalism. I mean, not identical, obviously. He wants to move beyond throwing an altar, but he does seem to think, at least in Democracy the God that Failed and elsewhere, that monarchies are private states, um, much like he would envision a future anarcho-capitalist society where private actors uh, run corporate, you know, military corporations or, or like I don't know, Walmart-style corporations. Um, so, what, what do you think about his his whole monarchy anarcho-capitalist fusion analysis analysis thing? Well, when he published his book Democracy: The God That Failed, I wrote a review of it for. Originally, I wrote that for Antistate.com, which was an anarcho-capitalist website that was around back then. Uh, this was about 15 years ago. And I gave um, Hoppe a glowing review of that particular book. Um, and the main reason I did so was because at the time I was very interested in exploring ideas that critiqued modern systems of liberal democracy. Um, and I had was it was rare that I came across material of that type. Um, and and the reason for that was the reason I was interested in that topic was uh, it always seemed to me that most people, you know, quote unquote, normal or mainstream people in our modern, you know, Western, liberal, capitalist, parliamentary societies, most people are really anarchists. Maybe you're not, but most people are really anarchists when it comes to all forms of the state, except the liberal democratic state. Um, they, uh, you know, for, you don't really find that many ordinary people off the street in the modern in industrial technological societies who would claim to be monarchists or proponents of a hereditary uh, aristocracy or uh, or ruled by an elite oligarchy or who were advocates of a theocracy or a military dictatorship or fascism or Nazism or, or communism the way the, 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 you know, the Bolsheviks envisioned it. Uh, most people, I mean, probably 99 plus, well, maybe 90 plus percent of people in modern societies believe that liberal democracy is a legitimate form of the state and the only legitimate form of the state. Um, you know, we don't really, you know, for that reason, I've never believed that anarchists like myself needed to waste a whole lot of time talking about, for example, how awful fascism is, uh, like a lot of these anarchists do today. You know, of course, fascism is an awful system. Um, of course, Stalinism is an awful system. Of course, an absolute monarchy is an awful system. Of course, a military dictatorship is an awful system. Not that many people in today's world disagree with that. But it's liberal democracy that has this facade of being government of the people, for the people, by the people, and is what is considered legitimate. So I was very interested in Hoppe's uh, efforts to attack liberal democracy because what he essentially argues is that uh, liberal democracy is basically the rule by 51 percent. You know, it's it's 51. Uh, it's the 51 wolves and the 49 sheep devoting on uh, voting on what to have for dinner. Uh, it's also uh, ruled by coalitions of interest groups trying to uh, extract value from one another. Uh, you know, essentially different kinds of economic, political, and cultural groups trying to uh, essentially plunder or suppress their opponents and, and things of that nature. So. Uh, it, it, it's rare that you find that much writing that critiques liberal democracy. Now, you do find criticisms of democracy in pre-modern political theory, some of the stuff we were talking about earlier, um, uh, Plato and Aristotle, and then later Aquinas, and uh, you know, obviously a lot of the throne and altar traditionalists, you know, um, thinkers like um, uh, Joseph de Mice and Louis de Bono and uh, Cortez, and then even in modern political philosophy, you find uh, critique critics of mass democracy like uh, um, uh, Jose Ortega y Gossage and Bertrand de Juvenal, and, and on the more ex extreme fringes, Julius Avila and, and thinkers like that. Carl Schmitt actually is interesting um, as in that regard. In fact, that's actually how I developed an interest in Carl Schmitt as well, is because he was another one of the few modern thinkers that would actually subject 
uh, liberal democracy to any kind of criticism. Uh, so excuse, excuse, I, I, what I was trying to get at was um, you one point in one of your reviews for Attack the System, you you, you called the society of Hoppe anarcho-Stalinism. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That, uh, that's kind of what I wanted to maybe get at a little bit more. <laughs> okay, okay. Um, well, I yeah. Well, I wrote a, a very glowing review of Hoppe's book, and then I wrote a follow-up where I criticized certain aspects of it that I disagreed with. Uh, and one was uh, this idea that he, you know, he had he kind of envisions anarch anarchic systems that are kind of like feudatories, uh, you know, ruled by these kind of crypto monarchs. Uh, and he's talking about how he wants to expel people from you know different society. In fact, he's actually gotten famous for that now for the the physical removal line, in his um, in his uh, one of his books where he's talking about well, in a true libertarian society, we're going to have to kick out Democrats and socialists and communists and you know all these other. It goes down this long list of groups that he doesn't like. Uh, you know, sort of, you know, and it, yeah, I, at the time, I think I wrote something like it sounded like the Stalinist rhetoric against uh, uh, bourgeois co cosmopolitans or, you know, uh, something like that. But, uh, but yeah, so I, there are certain aspects of his thinking that I think are problematic uh, in that regard. Um, but um, I, I'm not, well, I'm not a monarchist either. I mean, I, I don't know that I really agree with Hoppe's view on monarchism as being uh, a stateless system or really being even uh, comparable to anarcho-capitalism. I mean, a, a monarchist system was more like our modern dictatorships, in my view. I mean, every every monarch, every system of monarchism. Um, well, you did. We did have types of monarchies that were more, you know, where the monarchy had to share power with other institutions. Like during the Middle Ages in Europe, the, the monarchies could never really get a monopoly on power. They were always. Um, having to share power with the aristocracies, with the, the church, with the guilds, with the free cities, with all these other institutions. Um, but what what happened over time, for whatever reason, the monarchies started to get um, absolute power and become absolute monarchies. And I would argue that absolute monarchies are like modern dictatorships. They're predecessors to modern dictatorships. They had the same kinds of powers that modern dictators had and, they, and would use them in similar ways. Uh, you know, I think, for example, uh, Ferdinand and Isabella expelled all of the Jews from Spain at one point, you know, um, and and that's just an example. I mean, you, there are plenty of other examples like that. So I, I don't agree with that aspect of Hoppe's work. I, I do like his criticisms of liberal democracy, not so much his defense of traditional monarchies. Yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah, it was all really interesting, but that, kind of, that was kind of the question I wanted you to answer because I think I think because Hoppe's kind of, Again, that that line between when you cross into statism, when you cross into anarchism, he's trying to give his own account of it, and it's an interesting yeah. one, even if it's not wholly satisfying. Um, is there any um, is there anything else you wanted to say about Hoppe or the classics or anything like that? Uh, not specifically, no. Okay, so I'm thinking it's it's been about an hour. We should probably wrap it up. Is there is there anything you want to say before we end? Uh, well, if I, if I could, I'd like to go through just a small trajectory here about, you know, how I see some of the arguments for the state. Um, oh, I, sure, sure. I could give an overview of that. Um, you know, I, I take the arguments for the state seriously. I mean, I consider them, them to be serious intellectual arguments. I don't dismiss people who make arguments for the state as being unenlightened morons or, or something like that. You know, I, these are all interesting ideas. Um, the one argument for the state is the argument of inevitability. Um, the, probably the most advanced version of that is uh, the iron law of oligarchy. Uh, Robert Michaels, a, uh, a sociologist from the early 20th century, a former anarcho-syndicalist actually, uh, developed this idea called the iron law of oligarchy, which says that all organizations of any size are by definition going to be in, uh, oligarchies with a few lead the many and that's going to be the state as well as well as any other kind of institutions parties businesses unions etc um, I, I would say that whether the iron law of oligarchy is true or not uh, there's still a difference between non-state organizations and the state itself uh, even if we could make the argument that the state is inevitable from the point of view, the state as I've defined it previously is inevitable from the point of view of the iron law of oligarchy, I'd still say that uh, 
using that to just to legitimize the state per se is, is a, is a has a problem that sort of leans towards the naturalistic fallacy. The naturalistic fallacy being the idea that if something occurs in nature, it must be good. You know, even if the state is inevitable, you know, according to the iron law of oligarchy, I would say that it's it's inevitable in the same sense that hurricanes and tornadoes and earthquakes are, are inevitable, or that disease is inevitable, or that uh, predatory criminal individuals are inevitable. It doesn't mean that we don't look askance at these things. It doesn't mean that we don't make efforts to safeguard ourselves against these things. Uh, we could all, we could say, for example, well, crime just occurs in nature. Violent crime just occurs in nature. You know, let's just let these uh, uh, criminal types just have free reign. All right, that's that wouldn't really be a very practical approach. And I'd say that about the state as well. Whether whether an exploited whether ruled by an exploitive oligarchy is inevitable or not, it's still good to safeguard against that the best we can. You know, Thomas Jefferson's idea on eternal vigilance and all that. Now, another argument that's often used for the state is the, what I call the argument for semantics. And that basically says this. The question is, aren't anarchists really just advocating for a different kind of state? Uh, and again, I think the key issue there is some people obtaining privileges over others they would not have if the state were not assisting them. Uh, that argument, I think, also has to be qualified in the sense of, you know, um, at, relative to an individual's place in the wider set of social and political and economic hierarchies. For example, we could say somebody on the on food stamps is being assisted by the state, but they're not part of the ruling class, they're not part of the elite class, and they're certainly not part of the leisure class. Uh, there's also practical arguments for the state. There's, you know, what about defense? What about economic development? What about provision of services? What about protection of, say, civil rights against, uh, you know, exclusionary local communities? What about internal order, per se, crime and all that? Um, there's actually a great deal of anarchist and libertarian writing about this issue, addressing this issue. Um, I'm not going to go into all those arguments. We don't have time. But um, one of my favorite um, pieces of writing on that is an essay by Kirkpatrick Sale um, called The Necessity of the State. And he says he has necessity in scare quotes because he doesn't really believe in the necessity of the state. But that's that's a great essay that really um, addresses those questions on um, on, on very simple you know, lay people uh, level terms. Uh, the, the Necessity of the State by Kirkpatrick Sale, who's the sort of the founder of bioregionalism. Uh, there are other works like this as well. Uh, there's a book called Reinventing Anarchy and Reinventing Anarchy Again. Uh, it's a series that gets, addresses some of these qu practical questions. Uh, the writings of Colin Ward, uh, he's a Briti British anarchist who's written about this a bit. Uh, he has a book called Anarchy in Action. That's something of a classic. Um, so that's one argument. Now, another other sets of arguments uh, for the state are the philosophical arguments that are used in modern philosophy. You've, you've talked about the arguments from classical philosophy, Plato, Aristotle, Augustine, some of that. You know, there's also thinkers like Hobbes, Locke, Rousseau, who introduced ideas like the social contract, uh, implicit consent, popular sovereignty. Uh, those arguments have already been criticized by a lot of anarchists and libertarian thinkers, you know, you know, as, as well or better than, than I could. So I'll just leave that be, except to say that I think those kinds of arguments are essentially assuming too much. I think that the you know, the Hobbesian or so on social contract theory is kind of a radical, it's kind of a, it's kind of a rhetorical trick. Uh, it's, it's something that, you know, it's, it's, um, it's, it's essentially assert, asserting what it wishes to prove when there's really not much substance there when you try to peel away the, the actual argument and the actual substance behind the argument. Uh, you know, there are other arguments for the state. One is, uh, was, and Nietzsche came close to advancing this argument. I don't know that he fully uh, advanced this argument. I was a true, serious believer in this. But Nietzsche and some others, similar thinkers, argue that the state is necessary for the development of a leisure class. Like they will argue that, well, yeah, the state creates this kind of oppressive and exploitive oligarchy. And that's good because that oligarchy becomes a leisure class, and it's it's this leisure class that creates culture. You know, they while everybody else works, you know, they're all doing science and art and philosophy and all of these things, and you know that's how we get Alexander the Great and Julius Caesar and, and Napoleon and all these great figures. You know, that's uh, that's one argument. Um, 
you know, I, to that I'd say that you know we certainly don't need uh, a, a tyrannical state or an exploited leisure class to create culture. You know, and, and even if we do, at what cost? You know, that's uh, that's another issue. Um, uh, lastly, I think another issue is uh, everybody that I have ever known personally who was not an anarchist who believed in a state of some kind didn't believe that just any kind of state was okay. I touched on this earlier a little bit, but um, everybody I have ever known personally who was a statist believed that their preferred model of state was the correct state. You know, it's not just any kind of state. Now, there are some people that come close to taking the position that just, you know, any kind of state is good as long as it keeps order. Uh, you know, Bill Lind actually comes pretty close to this. I've, I've seen stuff that he's written where he says, well, you know, whatever else could be said about the North Koreans, at least they keep order. You know, they prevent fourth generation warfare from arising or whatever. I, I suppose, you know, if, if order is all you care about, that that kind of argument might mean something. I don't know that I would be prepared to take it that far. And I think most people wouldn't either. Um, you know, I also, you know, I, as I said earlier, most modern people really believe that liberal democracy is the only legitimate form of state. They, you know, they really are anarchists when it comes to monarchies, aristocracies, oligarchies, theocracies, military dictators, fascism, communism, and Nazism. It's only their their only status when it comes to liberal democracy. And even then, it has to be their own sectarian form of liberal democracy. For example, there's a lot of people I know personally nowadays on the liberal and left end of the spectrum who insist that Trump is not a legitimate uh, president or you know his regime is not a legitimate uh, regime you know for you know whatever reason um, so you know I guess many people are kind of uh, you know approaching anarchism in that way um, you know we can also look at the historical trajectory behind some of these things and, and we can see that we see proto anarchistic ideas, uh, throughout many different kinds of societies and many different kinds of philosophical traditions and cultural traditions and and indigenous societies uh, throughout history, we can all we can go all the way back to the Axial Age and we can look at the Stoics and the Cynics and say they're really the first Western anarchists. We can look at the Taoists and say they're really the first Eastern anarchists. We can look at some of the medieval uh, peasant movements from the Middle Ages. We can look at you know uh, traditions within. Uh, traditional societies in Africa, among the Native Americans, among the Polynesians, among the Chinese, among the uh, even among some Islamic societies, among among Judaism, and see skepticism of state power, concentrated power, central power, an interest in decentralization, federalism, some of these kind of quasi anarchistic ideas. Uh, you know, there's a whole uh, historical trajectory there to draw on. Uh, so that you know that in a nutshell is, is my case you know why, why i'm an anarchist and not a statist yeah I, actually going through all that the two questions came to my mind to ask you one question was you you were you were indicating that the this artificial class that's supported by the state apparatus um you don't you don't like it in part because it's an artificial class but no, Grant, you're 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 not going to argue from some sort of you know objective moral standard. It's going to be more like, well, I prefer to get murdered, so let's arrest criminals, and that makes it safer. But what if somebody could argue to you that having such a class does make life better, um, as uh, well, you know, all things being equal, that they can have, uh, maybe they they have because they have this level of autonomy, due to having to sweat and toil, they can do things that otherwise couldn't be done. Doesn't that be culture? Just there's a certain things that need to be done, but can only be done with a class like that. Well, I would say at what cost, you know, I mean, okay, you know, I mean, you know, I mean, if it came down to having an exploited state on one hand and mass starvation on the other hand, well, maybe an exploited state doesn't look so bad, but, uh, you know, I, again, it's, you know, it's a matter of scale, but I mean, I'd have to look at individual cases like that on a, you know, on a case by case basis, you know, um, yeah, I mean, if we look at certain parts of the world today um, where, you know, the, where you don't really have a state, you don't really have anarchism, you just have a failed state and civil war and chaos and, and things like that, then there may be situations where perhaps a state that at least creates stability is, is better than, 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 uh, than total chaos. You know, for example, um, oh, one obvious example of that is what has happened in Iraq, you know. Um, you know, in Iraq, 
under Saddam Hussein, whatever else could be said about him, you know, he at least repressed these kinds of really, you know, anachronistic uh, Islamic uh, terrorist groups, uh, you know, ISIS type groups and stuff like that. And uh, and and Iraq under Saddam Hussein, while it was certainly a, an authoritarian, you know, tyrannical, you know, quasi totalitarian system. Uh, you know, it wasn't ISIS. Um, so, uh, you know, maybe, you know, if the choice is Saddam Hussein or ISIS, yeah, I'd probably take Saddam Hussein. But, uh, but again, you know, I mean, it's a, it's a matter of uh, circumstance and it's a matter of scale. It's not a, these are not absolute categories. You know, I don't, yeah. I, you know, I'm not, I don't, I'm not going to say, well, you know, no, I wouldn't want to have a, a society where marauding bands of, of lunatics like ISIS are running around cutting people's head off. That, therefore, we need to have a state like like the Ba'ath Party uh, under Saddam Hussein. Uh, you know, I think it all is circumstantial. Yeah. Um, one one more question I'd like to ask you is, I don't think you brought up this objection. Maybe you already did, but the are uh, the objection from impossibility, i.e., which could be viewed in a couple of ways. The the objection would be that anarchism has never really existed before, or or if you appeal to some anthropological anarchist, you know, in the hunter gatherers, they'll say, okay. But that was back when life was brutish, nasty, and short, and nobody wants to go back to that. But anarchism in the modern day, sophisticated sense, has never existed. And uh, due to whatever causal natural factors really can never exist. Well, what would you respond to an argument like that for maybe the argument of impossibility? Yeah, uh, that's a gr great question. Uh, my response would be that I would see anarchism as being like world peace. Uh, it may be that world peace is not achievable on a perfect or absolute or permanent basis, but we should still have as much of it as we could, as we sh as we can. Uh, and I would say the same thing about anarchism. You know, perhaps it's not achievable on a perfect or absolute or permanent basis or universal basis or, or you know, how we, however you even define that. Uh, but it's still a good idea to have as much of it as we can. Uh, you, know, for it, it, you know, to use the world peace analogy. Uh, you know, it may be that there will always be wars and rumors of wars, but that doesn't mean we want to encourage wars. You know, that doesn't mean we want to go out and try to uh, choose the most warmongering leaders we can find and, and things like that. Uh, that's uh, that's how I would see that issue. You know, I mean, whether the state is inevitable or not, you know, I would say the state may be inevitable in the same sense that, uh, like I said, uh, tornadoes are inevitable and earthquakes are inevitable doesn't mean we want there to be tornadoes and earthquakes and we don't try to find ways of safeguarding ourselves against those kinds of things. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so is there anything that you want to say before we wrap this up or did we sort of cover all the bases you wanted to hit? I think I've pretty much covered it. Yeah, okay. I'll just end by saying that I think, especially when with, with, with certain kinds of anarchists, but I think anarchists in general versus status in general, certain metaphysical presuppositions are very important in determining how somebody falls on either side of this. If you're a moral absolutist, if you believe in a transcendent deity or the gods of Olympus, of Olympus, then an argument for state based on some appeal to divine authority is going to carry a lot more weight than somebody who's a nihilist or an atheist or an agnostic who views reality as a sort of meaningless uh, system of interactions. And um, so, yeah, I think we're done for tonight. Thanks for coming on, Keith Preston. This is Todd Lewis of the Praise of Folly podcast, signing off.